Today we're at the farm of Mac Ferguson, who's a vegetable farmer from Algon County. And we're joined by Mark Richards, who's also a vegetable farmer, and he's from Kent County. Vegetables can be really hard on the soil. Generally speaking, vegetable soils tend to be coarser textured. They are more prone to compaction, and they're also more prone to erosion. Vegetable crops themselves have small, shallow root systems, and they don't have the fibrous network of roots that help keep soils open and more resilient to some of the stresses of vegetable growing. When we look at vegetable residue, there's not a lot of it, and it tends to be very low carbon to nitrogen ratio, which means it's not contributing a lot to the stable organic matter levels within the soil. Vegetable crops tend to be shorter season, which means the soils are bare and root free for longer periods of time. All of these factors make vegetable farming more challenging. So Mac and Mark are going to be talking about how they address some of these challenges, particularly through the technology of strip tillage. So we were a full width, broad acre tillage business, and it was successful. Why did we change? We ran into a problem. When wheat harvest ended, the rain stopped and the rain wouldn't start again until late August. So my question was, what can we do to have more plant available water? We were full acre tillage, or broad acre tillage for all the processing crops, mainly because you needed to be. But we did get into strip tillage in about 2015, 2016. A neighbor of mine across town kind of lent me a piece of equipment. We tried it, it worked. And we went and bought our own two years later and we're full strip tillage on our corn sugar beets. So we figured out how to adapt the strip tiller and the planter to successfully strip till tomatoes and we've been doing that for five years. Our introduction to strip till was in the fall of 2015. Southwest Ag had a machine, actually a soil warrior they brought down and did 125 acres for us in corn ground, soybean ground and wheat ground. It gave us an opportunity to grow a number of different crops, uh, different soil types, to, and we learned what was successful and what was not successful. What was really successful is there was no yield drag. We found with our silt loam soils, we needed a strip freshener. Um, they just sealed over, wouldn't dry. What was a problem some of the berms weren't big enough and we had blowout or washout in the berms and that was a really good lesson to learn at the outset. On our farm in, near Dresden, Ontario, we're growing processing tomatoes for the ConAgra company. We grow sugar beets for Michigan Sugar Company, corn, soybeans and wheat and we do try to sneak a little cover crop seed in most years to make sure our, cover most of our needs. The strip tilling fits in to all the crops except the ones that we know to. Rotation varies depending on where the tomatoes fit in the rotation, but a typical rotation for us on non-tomato growing land is wheat, strip tilled to sugar beets, strip tilled to corn, no tilled to soybeans, no tilled to wheat, repeat. We grow corn, soybeans, wheat, some edible beans, green beans, lima beans, and sweet corn. It's all about the soil, and it's about the environment in the spring, to be frank. We strip till everything. We're not experts at strip tilling green beans and lima beans yet. We're working on that. We purchased a soil warrior from Huron Tractor. We've made lots of modifications to the soil warrior. It is now a 16 row machine running four deep cogs behind the tank and 12 shallow cogs with lead coulters on the rest of the rows. We did that because we were told the machine's not heavy enough and we don't have enough horsepower to pull 16 deep cogs. So far, we like it. Since we started strip tilling, we run an, an Orthman One Tripper, which is a shank machine. We try to make all of our strips in the late summer and into the fall. And we do run a separate, different spacing unit for the tomatoes because we're still planting twin rows on 60 inch centers, but a six row Orthman was easily converted with just moving things around and works very well. Spring strips with the Orthman units, but we removed the shank and put a double cooler in place of the shank. So we're basically freshening the strip up, loosening some dirt up and blending some fertilizer in 
because we're after that flower pot effect where we're planting those tomato transplants and we're after that flower pot effect in corn and sugar beets where we're planting the seed and its roots are gonna get into a high fertility zone. For the vegetable strip tiller, so we, I mentioned we're running Orthman units. We have a 12 row machine to do. It does a sugar beets, which I consider a vegetable of sorts. But the tomato one, we bought a six row specifically to dedicate to tomatoes. One of the main things you have to have in a t for the tomato planter to work, I mentioned having a, a slightly wider strip and having more loose soil for the shoe to go through and not move too much loose dirt so it's still there for the press wheels to lock the plants in. We redesigned or I designed a, replaced the rolling baskets on the machine with rolling culda packers that are just the width of the strip. So we bought an old culda packer, had the machine shop make a heavy duty frame up. We beefed up where the basket mount is on the back of the row unit to handle the extra weight and built the frame and we run that and it does a very nice job of smoothing the soil. It gets rid of big clods in the spring because you got a nice packer system moving mm -hmm. and we went with the larger wheels to make sure it was still turning the sand and not push like a color packer will do behind a cultivator. <laughs> and that's the, main re that's the main change we made to that. So when we strip till into a cover crop or into bare soil, the strip tiller setup is basically the same. We're trying to make a good strip, trying to put fertility in the strip, and trying not to disturb the ground around it. Typically, we go through the cover crop when it's small enough, we don't have to worry about any modifications to the strip till unit. So if I'm planting tomatoes after a wheat crop, we are gonna use the rye, oat, hairy vetch mix, only between the rows. And we're gonna keep in mind that the vetch is not easy to kill. However, there are options to terminate the vetch in the fall and still leave the rye. For safety's sake, an oat rye blend works really good, gets you a nice top growth in the fall. You only have favor the oats on the rate side because they're all gonna die in the winter, especially when you have 10 below for a few days. And then you end up with a nice rye strip in the spring. And again, we're not working where those rye strips are. We're working in between them and being very successful. The rye cover crop has actually greatly improved our weed control in tomatoes. We strip till into everything. The most challenging has been to deal with clover. Because we have a coulter machine, we need sufficient moisture for it to penetrate. Unlike Mark's shank machine, he can just hook onto it and go anytime. We need moisture. I believe we're gonna move away from broad acre clover. Um, it's beautiful, love it. It can give you nightmares in the spring if you leave it. And this year we're leaving it. A couple things to, that we're doing that might be a little different. With the, our three tank machine, we're putting a cover crop on pretty near every acre if it doesn't already have it. When we're strip tilling vegetables and thinking about cover crops, you got to think about a lot more stuff. Um, one, today you can't have any grain that's going to end up in the package. Uh, two, chemicals are different when you talk about vegetables versus uh, commercial crops. Uh, three, weed control. And do we have weed control figured out perfectly? Absolutely not, Mark. Yeah. Plus, any little bit of cover crop in the field changes how well it carries equipment because of the living roots and because of some of the biomass on top. So specific to tomato planter, keep in mind we're a transplanter that drags this big shoe through the dirt. Using cover crops and strip tilling tomatoes, you gotta make sure you got that strip worked A, deep enough, B, wide enough that you have the proper amount of dirt for the press wheels to fill in the trench you just made with that huge shoe I mentioned. And C, you gotta be able to do subsequent passes. So a tomato crop, because of its sensitivity to most herbicides, requires inter row cultivation. So we've gotta get through as a cultivator. Our adaptation to get through higher residue on strip till tomatoes was a Hineker single shank cultivator. We still run the old 5,000s, but a 6,000 or even a 1,000 would work. The other producers that rely on tillage to manage the lumps they put through their tomato harvester. So they want a smooth, 
very homogenous soil that they're going to pick up with the header on the tomato harvester. So the header on the tomato harvester, there's two big 34 inch discs that just skim under the ground and cut the tomatoes off and they all come up. They're obviously taking a little bit of dirt with them. That homogenous soil tends to come up in a slab when it's a little bit damp, whereas our maybe less than perfection homogeny, where we have more inconsistent clod sizes, tends to be more friable even when it's damp and will actually break down and not come up in sheets in the tomato harvester. We have not had an issue with material other than tomatoes getting in the wagon, despite the fact we switched to strip till. Sometimes you think you're smarter than you are. Different people said, if you're going to get into strip tilling, the year before you start, plant your crops with RTK guidance. Didn't do that. Made year one tougher. As you can verify, Mark, the investment in technology is huge. We steer our strip till machine because it's a toad machine. We steer our primary planter because it's a toad machine. Uh, we're running RTK guidance on each piece of planting equipment. It costs real money to do that. Go one step further. I'd say if you're running a planter larger than 12 rows in Ontario and you're using a pull type strip till machine, you need to have planter guidance. Number one challenge that you have to address. The planter has to work efficiently and properly after you've made your strips. Concentrate on making a good strip in the spring that is suitable for whatever planter you're using. Number two, think about what you have to do in that field after you've planted. After you've strip tilled and planted, what other passes do you have to do? And this is specific to vegetables. So I'm in a row cultivation, do you have the right equipment to be able to handle increased residue and trash between the rows? Spraying, can you modify your herbicide application program to take advantage of what benefits you're seeing from any cover crops you left, but also address the concerns with you have two tilled strips that don't have that protection. How do you deal with that? And it could be banded or directed spraying if you need to, if you have a very weedy field. Don't be afraid to stop and make changes to your outfit if you don't think it's doing the right job or you get feedback from the planter operator, stop and make those changes because the first pass, the planting pass is the most important pass in any crop in my opinion and specifically for tomatoes. There's a lot of great people uh, here in Ontario that are doing this work and are happy to share with you their experiences, both good and bad. Talk to the resources you already use every day, your chemical reps, your agronomist at your local input supplier, your private agronomist if you use one, your neighbours. The guys you see in the field trying crazy things all the time, 90% of the time, if we're not busy and not grumpy that day, we'd probably stop to talk to you for a while or even let you ride in the tractor. Use and find information as your friend. If you're coming from a broad acre tillage system into strip till in any crop, but vegetables in particular, you are definitely going to introduce a burn down that you may never have done. If you're going to work a field three times, why waste the money driving with the sprayer and putting $15 of chemical out when the iron you're already putting through the field is going to kill everything. That being said, um, your efficacy of your herbicides, timing, etc. when you strip till can be just as effective, sometimes more effective than tillage. We do not see eastern black nightshade between our tomato rows anymore or between the strips, very little and usually the herbicide program will take care of the majority of it in the strips depending on your weather before and after application. A couple of our experiences. One, with a Coulter tillage strip till machine, we don't pull up stones like we used to. In vegetables, stones are a big deal. We don't have the stones that we used to. They're still there, they're in the soil, but we're not pulling them up. One of the things that shocked me about strip tillage is horsepower requirements. 30 horsepower per shank, or row, oh, but what about, how many hydraulic motors are we running? I think we got at least 60 horsepower tied up just so, in hydraulics. Then you got to move the machine with 10 ton in it. But yeah, you're right. Horsepower requirements when you're going to strip till are a big deal. I will go through without the fan on. It's a pain to unhook the cart the way it's set up and just run the strips and then come back over mm -hmm. shallow strips and put the fertilizer on the second pass 
because I don't have enough horsepower to do both. I'm surprised at how good our soil test results are. You know, it's pleasing to see that. We're finding that the soils are softer too. We're able to pull this tool easier than we did when we started. So yeah, there's positive changes. One of my goals is that we increase our organic matter over time, and I think we're on the right path. There's always going to be margin compression in our industry. What do we have to do? We have to grow good crops on a continuous basis. I'm trying to remove variability. And at the end of the day, we'd like the soils to be better tomorrow than they are today. But it's a journey that I think is well worth the time spent. Do your research, find out all you can about what you want to do, how you can accomplish that and what's available to get that done. And then start your journey with lower expectations perhaps than you may have had. And I'm not talking about a lower yield or I'm not talking about a poor quality crop, but you're not going to see the dramatic effects in year one that we may have mentioned in our conversation here today. It takes time. And it takes time to realize the ultimate goals of having a healthier, better soil and still maintain the productive capacity of the land that you're working with. But strip till helps.